Thanks so much for those of you that have been patiently waiting for part three of this series, because here it is, photorealistic rendering in Fusion 360. Even though this is part three in a series, you should still find the video useful even if you haven't seen parts one and two. If you'd like to use the same model that I'm using, you can download that in the description. Otherwise, any Fusion model you have will probably work for you to follow along. Once you've gotten the model the way you like it, we'll go ahead and switch over to the Render tab. As soon as you switch to this tab, you'll notice that your model already looks a little bit better, and that's because it starts to give you a nicer preview of your model at this point. The way we apply these materials is by hitting A or by using this beach ball here. So I'll just hit A to bring up my appearance palette. Once you have that open, anything that's in your design already will show up here, and anything that you'd like to add, you can search for down here in the library. As a woodworker, the thing I like the most about Fusion are their 3D wood textures. So while they have a lot of other choices that you can use in different scenarios, the 3D wood textures are really where we're going to focus in this video. If you just type 3D, you can search for the different options that you have here, or instead of searching, you can just come down here to wood, solid, and then choose finished, unfinished, stained, etc. If you find something that you want to use but you haven't downloaded it yet, you'll see this little download button that you can choose. So once you click that, you'll see that it's starting to download. And once it's finished, then you can drag and drop it off onto your model. Let me go ahead and delete this one. All right, it set it back to the default. I just want to show you again quickly how we apply this. Let me just search for walnut. Now they have a figure, a glossy, a semi-gloss. I just want to use a plain walnut with a semi-gloss. So I can drag it onto individual pieces here, or I can drag it over to the side and get, in this case, all four sides at once. So I'll do that, and that applies it to my model and puts it up here in my design. As a woodworker, when you're actually building the project, you'll select pieces that have the best grain for the side that you're showing. Well, you can do the same thing in Fusion, and to do that, you choose the texture map controls. Use these controls to position the grain on your piece exactly how you like it. You can even rotate the grain to get a different look. Slide in and out, up and down, and choose a piece that makes it look realistic for you. Now for me, I don't care for that as much. Let's go something a little tighter grained, maybe there. And then, let's see here. Ooh, that's kind of a nice look. So let's go with that. Hit OK to save your changes. And then you can do this on each of the pieces. So if I came back to texture controls, clicked on this one, maybe I want to slide this one up or down, or slide it across like that. Okay, once you've selected the best grain, now we can get on to some other aspects of the rendering by setting up our scene. To set up the camera, the scene, the lighting, etc., you click on the scene settings icon, and let's walk quickly through the settings that you're going to want to change. The first thing you'll probably want to change is change the default from sharp highlights to something like photo booth or maybe even soft light. But let's drag and drop photo booth over here onto our scene. You'll see the lighting instantly change. We'll play with this a little bit more in just a minute. Um, you don't have to mess with ground unless you want to see a reflection. So let's focus on the camera section for a second. The focal length will determine how distorted or how close to, you know, how fisheye your, your image is, or if you get too far out, it really starts to look like a 3D rendering and, and that it's not realistic. So I like to find somewhere in the 100 to 70 range I, is generally where I land. And occasionally you can go a little bit more, or a little less, depending on the thing that you're trying to render. So for this, let's go 70. I generally leave the exposure alone unless I have a reason to change it. Depth of field, give you this little warning, that's okay. Just means it's not going to show you the depth of field while we're in this preview mode until we go to maybe an in-canvas render. Depth of field is a term most often used in photography, but it applies to optics in general. And it describes the range or distance of area that is in focus versus the rest of the area that is progressively further and further out of focus. Now don't skip this step because I think this is one of the key ingredients to photorealism is just that little bit of blur as you move further away from where your eye is focusing. And you'll see this, barely see this green dot show up on your screen. That's where the camera's going to focus. So in this case, it would focus in the middle of our box, which is not what we want. So I'm just going to click here on the thumb grip, and that's where I want the camera to focus. The other thing you'll notice is it defaults to a blur of 1.00. And if I were to try to render this now, you'd see this entire back side of the box was incredibly blurry. So I generally drop this down to maybe around 0.2, um, sometimes a little down, a little up from there. The last piece I find super helpful in Fusion is to choose a viewport aspect ratio. Now, if I'm rendering for Instagram, for instance, I would choose square, and that lets me see 
on the screen, the dark areas won't be part of my picture and the light areas will. So if I try to render this now without having set that, my box would have been way too far to the left. So this lets you pose the shot exactly how you want it right here in the middle. Okay, once you have this set up correctly, you can go back up to the environment and we'll see if there's anything else we want to play with here. By choosing the position, you can tweak the angle of light that's going to be hitting our model. So as you start to move it, even just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, we start to get some more depth to our model. Now I, I like the look of it here. We start to see a shadow and you see this part's in the shadow and the light's casting over here. But feel free to try all 360 degrees and choose a angle that looks good and really complements the model that you're trying to render. Even something like this would look fine. So let's go back a little bit to the left, right about there. When you're done, just click that position icon again. And you may also want to choose to render the background from your environment. And that's really going to depend on which environment you have and whether or not that would look good. All right, let's leave this settings like this and click close. The end canvas render is a really great way to quickly get a view of what the model is going to look like when it has the finished render. So let's give this just a second. Once you go to the in canvas render, you'll start to see the blur show up from the depth of field. You'll also start to see the curl or the quilting in some of the more advanced materials. I really like the way this is looking, so I'm going to go ahead and do a final render. So we can stop this in canvas render and click the teapot. Now, if I'm rendering for Instagram, I just would type in 1080 here, which is the resolution that I want to up upload that at. When you're rendering, you have the choices of rendering it locally on your computer, which does use quite a bit of resources. On my older MacBook Air, this thing takes a little bit of time, but sometimes I'll still choose that. Otherwise, you can choose the cloud renderer and let this render up on Autodesk computers up on their servers, and then it will show you and let you download the image when it's done. So if I choose Cloud Render Final, the 1080, and click Render, you'll see now it says the cloud rendering started. Open up the gallery. You can see here this green stopwatch indicates that you're in queue. Now you can continue to work with your model. You don't have to do anything else at this point. And then whenever this is finished, our rendering will be done. So we'll come back and check on this in just a little bit. I'd encourage you, once you find a scene set up the way you like and maybe an environment and some of the other settings the way you want them, save them as the defaults. This means that these settings will already be available to you when you create a new document and you won't have to go through and tweak these each time. Now, of course, you will play with some of them like the focal length or maybe how much blur. Um, and even changing the environment, but having some of these things set up to begin with might be helpful. Let's do one more thing before we leave this. Let's go ahead and save this exact view. Now, if you accidentally click on this cube, click on the home, you won't be able to get the exact angle back. So right click on named views and save the view. So in this case, let's do camera render. So now if you end up leaving and going somewhere else, you'll be able to get back to the same angle. And you can save multiples of these. So maybe you want to have another one where you're rendering kind of at a very extreme angle. Now this starts to look a little fake with the background, so in this case I might turn off the environment, just let it be on a solid color. And then I can slide maybe this out. That's kind of an interesting angle. Maybe, maybe something like that. So then I can do that same exact process again. Right click, do a new named view, and call this uh, Stream angle. Now it doesn't remember the model posing, so when you switch back to camera render, you would have to, in this case, slide the lid shut again, but it does at least remember where you have the camera posed, and that lets you get back there quickly. All right, let's check on our rendering. All right, looks like it's almost done. Look here on the gallery to see. All right, fantastic. What a great rendering. At this point, you're gonna to wanna to save it to your computer. So you can choose the download and download as any one of these image types. And this is one of the benefits of going to the cloud. Locally, you're not presented with the option of also just getting it as a transparent image. You have to do that at the beginning, choose to render it transparent or not. In this case, we can download the image. Let's go ahead and save that. And then I'll download another one that has a transparent background. All right, save that. Just to show you what these look like, here is the rendering that we just got with the background included, and then here it is without the background, which will let us composite this on top of something else, uh, maybe in Photoshop or another program. We've made it halfway through. I hope you've already picked up some great tips and things to make your renderings better. But if you want to take your renderings even further, then stick with me as we look at linked models and third-party environments as we build a digital photo booth. 
Okay, let's create a new document. In here, we'll go to rectangle, choose center rectangle. All right, let's create something, let's see here, that's uh, 32 inches high and maybe 48 inches wide. Hit enter, stop the sketch, Q for our press pull. And then I'm gonna go minus half of an inch, put that right there. Doesn't really matter. In this case, I'm going down instead of up, so our model will kind of sit on top of it when I link it. And we'll just choose new component. Okay. Name this one desk. And let's go ahead and add a material to this before we pull our model in. So I'll hit A again, bring up our appearance palette. We should know by now we can search for something. So I'll search for pine. Let's go with 3D pine unfinished. Let's do a couple other changes here before I go any further. Turn off my grid. I want to make these a little closer together. So this is something else you can do with your appearance. You can double click on them. You can adjust the color. In this case, I like the color, but I do want to adjust how close these rings are together. So I can make them closer together by typing something like 0.5 centimeters or even maybe 0.4. Get a tighter grain pattern here. And then I can adjust how strong that grain is by adjusting this exponent. So maybe I want it to be a little lighter, maybe I want it to be a little darker. In this case, I just want to kind of tone it down a little bit so it doesn't draw away from our actual model. Okay, now that that's set up, let's link our model. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to call this one Photo Booth. All right, now open your data panel. At this point, you can right-click on your original model and choose Insert into Current Design. Now, it won't be linked if you create it across projects. This top piece here is the project. But as long as they're within the same project, they'll be inserted with this little link icon, and they'll stay linked to your original model. So let's zoom in here a little bit. Let's turn this box. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and hit close this now. Hit M to move or copy. Choose Create a Copy. And let's start to set up our scene. Now I can have two of these. Position this maybe about there. Let's see how that looks. You can kind of play with this and set it up as if you're setting it up on a desk. All right, that looks pretty good. Zoom in. Yeah, that's nice. All right, so now we have that set up. Depending on how much you want to take this photorealism, you may even go as far as I did in this case and create other models you can insert as props. Now, this isn't very hard to do, but if you do have something else, in my case, I have a pencil I designed. I'm going to go ahead and insert that in my current design as well. Now, this is certainly not necessary, and again, it depends on how much time you want to put into this render. Now, just having two of the exact same model with the exact same grain pattern doesn't sound super exciting to me. So, let's go ahead and give ourselves a variant. And this is where the this photo booth concept or the idea of linking your models into something else so you can try out different colors really is kind of handy. So let me bring this up here so we can see the other model. This one in the back here is version 2, the colon 2. So let me open this up so I can see the different pieces of it and then hit A. So let's search for maple. All right, let's just do a normal maple semi-gloss. I'm going to bring that onto the box. That will make the box maple. And then let's do walnut. Do the walnut semi-gloss and we'll set that on the splines. Walnut on the thumb grip. And here you're going to learn something else. When I bring the walnut over here onto the lid and I choose top, you see this warning. This component has appearances assigned to bodies or faces. They cannot be removed because they're in a reference component. So effectively what it's saying is even though I've applied a style to the component, the body has its own style. And so I'd have to remove that if I want to continue. So I'll hit close, save this, go back to my original model and let's fix that. So I'll hit A again. In this case, we want the maple and we want it applied here, but we don't want it on the body. We want it on the component so we can override it. So I'll just drag this over here to top. And it'll ask you, you want to remove the appearance or keep them. So I want to say remove. Once I hit save, to come back, you'll notice that I have this symbol warning me that I'm out of date now with my model. So I can click on that up here to update it. Once it's relinked and reloaded the models, you'll see now I actually have the walnut applied to the top, and that's because we fixed our model. And this applies to any of the changes that we make in our model. Anything we make over here and save, we can just update with a click of a button, and our photo booth will have the latest version of our model. 
All the joints still work from our original model, so we can open the lid on these things if we want to. So let's go over to the render tab. Now if you've saved your defaults, this render tab will already start to look better because it will have remembered some of your settings from before. All right, let's go ahead and do this one as a 4.3 render. All right, I'm gonna show you one other trick that you can do if you really want to, to take this to the next level. And instead of just using the built-in environments that come with Fusion, you can get additional ones. Now, of course, there's ones you can pay for, but there's some free ones as well. I'll include a link in the description so you can find this one here. This one is free. Uh, it's a pay what you want. Um, and it includes these high dynamic range photographs that let you provide what looks like real lighting from these different scenes. Now, if you want to, you can also include the background. I'm gonna use this one here, this loft. It has a plant and some other things in it. and has this beautiful sunlight coming in the window. So let's go back to Fusion. And if you've downloaded something like this, you can come in here to the scene settings and choose replace custom environment. Once you do that, I'm gonna choose the loft that I downloaded. It takes a little bit for this to load into Fusion, but once it does, you'll start to see some different lighting. All right, here's the lighting. Now, because I had the environment background showing, you actually can see the picture and see as we spin this around what we're looking at. So notice how the lighting on the models really start to change. Now, I don't think we want to aim at the uh, cleaner on the counter there, so let's go the other direction. All right, maybe something like that. Yeah, something like that. Looks pretty nice. So I'll go ahead and turn back on depth of field. Actually, turn off the position, then turn back on depth of field. Yes, I understand. Choose the aim right here in the front. And again, don't forget to set the blur or something low, maybe 2 or 2.5. All right. We can zoom this in just a little bit. And let's render a final quality image. So this one here is going to give me a really high resolution image. Let's go ahead and render that. Once again, if you open the rendering gallery, you can see that we're here in the queue. Let's just give that some time and we'll see how long that takes to render. Now, the only problem with taking one of your models this far in the rendering process is you might actually convince your brain that you finished the project already, and that's, of course, not true. The best part is try to make the product in real life match your rendering. Once the image is done, be sure to download it and share it with your friends. And don't be surprised if they compliment you on the quality of your woodworking, thinking this is a photo of the finished product instead of just a 3D render. Whew. This was a long video. I appreciate it if you've stuck with it this far. I hope you've learned something. And if you have some suggestions or even feedback for me, please leave those in the comments below. In part four of this series, I'm gonna look at how we can use Fusion 360's drawing tools to create printable plans. Thanks so much for watching.